Okay, so uh, we're going to get restarted. Uh, the next session is uh, how billions of dollars of Eastern European criminal proceeds are laundered into the West. And the subject matter uh, of this session, uh, the presenters, uh, they work uh, for the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And, and what they're going to discuss with you today, they've actually uh, won a, uh, the uh, equivalent uh, of a Pulitzer Prize for uh, Europe. So it's basically a, a European Pulitzer. So they're both uh, very accomplished and their work has been uh, duly uh, and properly rewarded. We have uh, Paul Radu and uh, Drew Sullivan. Uh, who uh, both uh, reside in Eastern Europe. So um, if you guys could get started. Great. Thanks, David. I wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm coming from Eastern Europe. This looks like a bottle of vodka. So <laughs> I was thinking I'm at home. Cheers. <laughs> um, I also am quite proud of this tie. It was given to me by the... Uh, the European presidency uh, last week, um, so I can now say uh, Europe is officially choking me. So uh, I'll loosen that a little bit. So um, the, the, let me quickly tell you about who the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project is. We're a consortium of investigative centers that stretch from Europe all the way to China. And uh, we're one of the world's largest investigative reporting organizations. We did about 68 stories last year, investig large investigative projects. Um, and we have about 125 reporters uh, working in many, many different countries. People don't know us very well because a lot of the stories we publish are through partner organizations, uh, through our local organizations. And so we're kind of that, like that old BASF commercial where you, know, you don't know us, but you know our products. Um, and so I'm going to uh, have Paul go ahead and start. Paul is the, is the, um, the uh, uh, executive director of the, the center, and I'm the, uh, the editor um, at OCCRP. Um, thank you, Drew. Um, hi, everybody. So I mean, what we do at uh, OCCRP, at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, is obviously uh, we investigate organized crime and, and corruption. And we specialize for the past five years um, in following offshores, following banks, uh, going undercover. Uh, what you see right now projected on the screen, for instance, Killers Incorporated is a documentary. It's a 44 minutes documentary that we released uh, recently where we look at the um, connection between money laundering in Eastern Europe, high, uh, high scale, large scale money laundering and um, uh, hired killers. Um, but what I will uh, introduce you, uh, introduced uh, right now is um, our project called the Russian Laundromat. And can we uh, get the PowerPoint presentation up if you all can do that? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I actually have to start by telling you a few words about this uh, tiny country of Moldova. So the Republic of Moldova is a, is a country of 3.5 million. It's, it's a small country. Is at the edges of the uh, European Union. It's a, um, a, a country in the former Soviet Union, and uh, it has a GDP of about uh, eight billion a year. And I'm, I, I think I'm uh, overstating it. You know, it's, it's probably less than that. Um, now, when we looked at this, what we dubbed the Russian, Russian laundromat, we looked at um, a money laundering in the tune of 20 billion U.S. dollars via the Republic of Moldova in a time span of three years. So again, imagine this tiny country, you know, small population, you know, uh, low GDP, and this kind of money, you know, that are laundered uh, via just one single bank. Um, when we, when we uh, initiated this project, you know, um, we got a few warnings. Um, and those warnings uh, came to us from various databases uh, that are connected to courts in Moldova. We saw that there were really poor Moldovans from villages uh, that were sued in court and asked to repay loans um, in the tune of you know, 500 million US dollars, you know, 400 million, the biggest uh, lawsuit was 800 million. So these guys, these poor Moldovans, were asked to repay this money to various companies based in the UK or in Delaware. Now, 
In fact, they, this, uh, this laundromat, this 20 billion, uh, this is just a chunk of, an, uh, of a much larger money laundering operation that was conducted out of Russia, which um, is about uh, 80 billion. So we're, we're talking big, big money here. And it all starts, you know, with these uh, documents, this bill of exchanges or promissory notes, um, the previous one. So this is one, one of the first. Uh, this is in the tune of 180 uh, million US dollars. This other one, I'm not sure you, you can see on the screen there, uh, this is in the tune of uh, 500 plus uh, million US dollars. And so on, uh, and so on, and so on. This is in the tune of uh, 400 million. So these documents were presented in courts in Moldova, and I'm talking about uh, tiny courts in, uh, even in mm, not quite villages, but like townships, like really, really small, small towns. And um, there were judges receiving these, these claims in court uh, with lots of uh, documents attached to them, and then they would uh, basically approve the repayment of these loans. Um, but the trick was, the initial bill of exchange, the initial promissory note, was always between a Delaware company and a UK company. But on the back of the promissory note, you'd, you'll, uh, you'd always have these, uh, these uh, inscriptions where the money would change hands. So instead of the, uh, paying to the company in Delaware, uh, you know, you'd pay to this other company, and instead you know, of, the, um, um, of, the, uh, of the company that had the loan, you know, they, they, they always replace the companies so that in the end they, um, they had Moldovan and Russian companies, and always a Moldovan man, a Moldovan uh, guy, uh, involved in repaying the debt. And that was the trick, you know, to, um, to make sure that they could insert this money in the banking system. Because you'll see, this money didn't stay uh, in Moldova. They came from Russia. Um, th this is one, uh, one example, you know. There's a company called Velmont Properties Limited, uh, based in the UK, who signs a contract, a, a fictitious contract, with uh, another company based in the UK called Seabon Limited. This is, you know, for 180 million US dollars. Now, the debt, uh, according to the, to the back of the promissory note, um, is always guaranteed by companies from Russia, and in this case, a Moldovan guy called Andrei Abramov. Now, Andrei Abramov and the Russian companies are called in court in Moldova, and the judge, you know, says, you guys have to pay this money to this company. And then what happens is, the money is sent from Russia. Of course, the Moldovan guy cannot pay nothing, you know. The money is sent from Russia, from the Ru Russian companies, uh, to the bank accounts in, uh, in, uh, Lat in, uh, in Moldova first, in this single bank in Moldova, and from there they go to Latvia, they enter the e EU. So in this way, you know, there were uh, about 80 billion that left Russia, you know, in three years um, and uh, entered the, the EU. I'm not sure you, uh, you see this exactly, but when we looked at this, you know, at these court cases, and of course we looked at the companies, and as usual, you'd run in the, you know, the uh, proxies that we always ran into, uh, you know, guys from Latvia, guys from Delaware, guys from everywhere, you know, all sorts of uh, networks of uh, uh, formation agents. But then we decided to go after the banks, because what we realized was there's a number of banks in Russia. Um, namely 19 banks in Russia, one bank in Moldova, and always one bank in Latvia, same, same banks. And we looked at the ownership of these banks. We treated the banks just like uh, uh, companies, which they are, in fact. Um, and we looked at, at the, the ownership of these banks, and what we found out was, uh, was quite interesting to us. So for instance, uh, one, um, one connection that we found was that Igor Putin, no other than the cousin of Vladimir Putin, was on the board of some of these banks and was also a shareholder of some of these banks uh, via companies based in uh, Cyprus. Now, if you look at the, uh, the shareholders of, uh, of these financial institutions, it, that's, that, that in itself is quite an adventure because they are not transparent at all. So you'll find out you know, that there are companies in the Seychelles that own 0.49% you know, uh, um, uh, percent of the shares, companies in Cyprus and so on. Of course, they, want, they need to be under the 5% the threshold there so they, do, they don't declare the beneficial ownership. Uh, so, but analyzing the ownership of these banks uh, came, came, uh, came up with, for us you know, with some really uh, interesting names besides Igor Putin. We found some, uh, some people connected to the FSB, which is the former KGB. 
Uh, we find, found them, for instance, uh, you see a guy here called um, Alexander Grigoriev, and uh, he's, he's connected not only to the banks themselves, but he's connected to Igor Putin in other companies, for instance, companies that conducted uh, construction in Sochi, you know, with the, the Olympics that took place in, in Russia. So there was a wealth of connections here. Um, what was also quite interesting is when you look at the companies involved, the companies from Delaware, the companies from the UK, uh, the banks, you'll see the same people at all ends of this, of this money laundering. So you'll see, for instance, that the bank in Moldova, it's, it's a bank called Moldincom Bank. I think I have a picture of it. This is uh, Igor Putin, the cousin of uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, this is Moldincom Bank. You know, this is the main headquarters of the bank in uh, Chisinau, in Moldova. If you look at the ownership of this uh, bank, you'll see that uh, there are quite a few offshore type of companies that own shares here, you know. Um, and there's a particular company from Gibraltar where you, where you find the same, same shareholders and directors as the companies on, the, on those bill of exchanges, on those uh, promissory notes. So there's, there's always these connections, you know, between the companies and the banks. This is the bank in, uh, in Latvia that uh, received all this money. So the money went from Russia to Moldova, from Moldova to Latvia. Um, we always uh, run into Latvia uh, whenever we investigate money laundering in Eastern Europe. And that's for, for a few reasons, you know. It's the proximity to Russia, of course. It's uh, a lot of Russian population in Latvia. The fact that Latvia is in the EU. Uh, the fact that the, the banking system is not quite overseen there. Uh, and, and so on. Um, this, is, this bank is called Trusta Commerzbanka. Um, and this, for instance, is one of the Moldovans that had to repay the debt. So he, <laughs> he showed up on those, uh, you know, promissory notes. Now, this guy is drinking uh, a really cheap beer, you know, it's called Baltica, you know. Um, this is the same guy, you know. So he had to repay about 400 million US dollars, you know. When we confronted him, when we met him, he said, wow, this is like, I wished I had like, you know, a few bucks, you know, because he's, he's poor. He's, he's really, really, really poor. And then he, he explained, and not only him, we identified, uh, you know, at least a dozen of these guys, um, how he was contacted, you know, and how he lent his name to these other guys, you know, how he gave the passport away, you know, for, for these guys to do whatever things they did with, with the passport. Um, this is, um, so lots of the companies involved um, were actually ran by these Ukrainian citizens. So not only Moldovans were involved in this, also Ukrainian citizens. <laughs> and, uh, you know, w when, when you actually create such uh, interesting schemes, when you want to go for the, for the big money, you always try to be as careful as possible. But the level of uh, the gra gra granularity is, is, I mean, they don't always expect you to, to investigate from like kind of many, many sides of, of this business. So, for instance, in this case, they used these Ukrainian proxies that were all based on the same street in a village in the outskirts of Kyiv. You know, so everybody was based on this, on this particular street that you see, you see here. So sometimes you, you find the connections, you know, because um, they are careful, but not as careful. I mean, the people behind the, the scheme. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the impact of this, of this investigation. So we, we looked at this, you know, and uh, we uh, proved that the money went, you know, into the EU, and we proved that some of the money were due to go to a business uh, uh, in uh, Montenegro where um, uh, that guy Grigoriev was supposed to build a hotel together with the Kempinski chain, and the Kempinski uh, chain just backed off this deal, you know, because of our reporting. Um, Trusta, Commerzbanka, you know, they defending them, themselves against, uh, you know, money laundering claims. They accused us of all sorts of, uh, uh, you see here, that the report published by OCRP is a, bi a biased publication, a jumble of distorted facts and speculations of journalists against the bank. Uh, what they failed to explain was uh, why Moody's uh, withdrew the rating to the bank, you know. Um, so there were... Um, there were a number of uh, outcomes. Uh, one other outcome was this, that uh, uh, the United Kingdom started an official investigation into this because some of the money, I'd say as usually, uh, went to the UK, went to London, uh, was invested there. 
some of the money, and you'll hear more from my from my colleague about this. Uh, you know, some of the money uh, went to various uh, bad actors uh, all across Eastern Europe. Um, one of the banks involved, one of the the banks involved in uh, what we dub the Russian laundromat was actually the one that also financed the Marine Le Pen uh, National Front in France, which is an extremist party. Um, now, the truth is, we don't really know where all this money went. We know where, you know, a, a small, small part of it went. Um, so this money, you know, they were injected in the EU system and we don't really know where, uh, where they went. Um, now, you know, it's, for, for journalists, it's always uh, important to find, okay, so what? I mean, you have this money laundering, you have money going from Russia to Moldova, from Moldova to Latvia, so what? It's always very important to find the human angle. And um, what we found, you know, um, in this case was that this money generated a lot of corruption. Um, judges uh, in various courts in Moldova were bribed, got bribed. They, they judged these cases, they approved these loans, uh, and then they retired, you know. Um, we met some of them uh, afterwards, you know, in parking lots where they came driving, you know, the latest SUV and things like this, you know. Um, it generated a lot of corruption in law enforcement. Uh, it, it fueled organized crime because some of the people involved uh, with this scheme, you know, are not very nice guys. I'm, I'm not talking about the white collar kind of, you know, guy who's, you know, interested in a bit of money laundering. I'm talking about criminals, I mean, killers, you know. Um, besides that, you know, this is, a, is an image from uh, three days ago from Chisinau, where about 10,000 people, according to estimates, maybe more, took the streets because right before the elections of last year in November, um, three banks, um, they are part of this, um, of the broader uh, money laundering scheme that I was talking about. Three banks gave uh, one billion in loans to offshore companies and nobody can identify who has to repay the loans. And this, this created a serious dent in the banking system in Moldova. And now uh, Kroll was hired by the government, you know, to conduct an investigation into this, to see who, who are actually the beneficial, you know, uh, who, who received the money, you know, nobody knows. So just one billion just disappeared, you know, from the, from the banking system. So this happens uh, a lot in, in such countries and Moldova is not alone uh, in this. Um, um, all over Eastern Europe we have such, uh, uh, large-scale money laundering operations and these these are damaging you know and you see th these people in this picture they were they were shouting you know we want our billion back we want our billion back which is kind of funny you know but you know it's it's really hurting the economy in, the, in a country like this where people are so poor Moldova is one of the poorest countries uh, in the world okay so for for more context uh, I'll let my my colleague uh, speak uh, he will present you with a with a bigger picture to this and, and just just uh, just a couple comments on on the story as well. I mean, you know, um, the, the 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 system was set up that way so that ultimately, when the money went into a Latvian bank, that there would be a judge's stamp on it saying that this was money paid from a a bad debt, and that that allowed them to get the coverage once the uh, the money was in in um, in Latvia. And to to get that, you needed, as Paul said, to bribe a judge. You know, but but a typical judge's salary in Moldova is probably less than, I don't know, maybe $800 a month or $600 a month. It's less less than that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our, you know, reporters go for $250 a month in Moldova. So it's not difficult to, you know, bribe whole levels of bureaucracy in these countries, you know. And that's why these countries are, are used. And, and the connection, of course, with Russia and the connection, there's a number of large um, organized crime groups that operate um, out of Moldova. And, you know, this is all part of a kind of a regional, what we call a criminal economy um, uh, that's been set up um, to do everything from money laundering um, to, uh, to help with um, capital flight, to help with tax evasion, um, you know, to commit fraud. Um, and it's, it's really um, a cooperation, a cooperative effort, not only of, you know, uh, criminal groups, but often state actors. In fact, state actors often set up some of these, these uh, uh, money laundering schemes. 
You know, um, in, in the past we've seen where, you know, former FSB agents or, or other people um, or current FSB agents you know, are directly involved in the setup and operation of, of some of these things. So you have in many of these countries where the line between, you know, crime and, and government is, is somewhat, you know, um, unclear. Um, and in fact, we've got many countries that operate as de facto criminal states. You know, Montenegro is a, is a drug trafficking country um, operating uh, as a state. Um, Kosovo is not much different. Uh, Serbia is fast becoming a, a um, controlled by drug gangs. And so you can get these states become places where this, this can operate. Now, Moldova and, and you know, Latvia are, are, are commonly involved in this because at the end of the, um, the Cold War, both were places where there were large Russian populations and FSB agents and other things where this infrastructure was in place. Um, you know, but it, it becomes a system that is uh, extremely cooperative so that you get all these people working together. And one of the former stories we looked at, we did another large money laundering case where it was about $900 million that was passed through over a six month period. And um, in that case, you could see money that was coming from, uh, you know, state companies. What would happen is money from a Mexican drug cartel would go to a Latvian bank and then the next day money would go out and pay off the debt of a Russian state company. And you would see, you know, Asian triad groups working in the same, you know, with the same data. And the people who stole the Magnitsky money, the big tax fraud in Russia, you know, that we passed the Magnitsky Act on, um, they were passing money through the same bank. So, you know, this is not just a couple individual bad actors. This is actually part of the economy um, in, in mo most of these countries. And I suspect this is common in Africa and some other places, although I think it's fairly sophisticated in what's going on in Eastern Europe. And so consequently, you have the situation where, where, where um, it's complete cooperation between all these parties to move these monies around uh, on the international scene. And it becomes extremely difficult to track down because as you go look into it, you end up in one of those streets in, in, you know, near Kiev or something like that where you've got you know, some, you know, local hillbilly who, you know, you know, owns a $800 million company. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, the other thing about this is it's a, it's an integrated system, uh, you know, that's designed to accommodate a bunch of different crimes. You know, so you'll see something that, that will not only do fraud and money laundering, but will be connected with operations that are involving drug trafficking or smuggling or counterfeiting. Um, and in fact, you know, we've seen, we've seen incredibly clever businesses set up where, you know, cement companies are owned and they're doing trade-based um, money laundering, um, but they're also moving on the same ships that are moving the cement back and forth. They have these little vehicles that trail under the water that they can detach when they get near port, and that's got a, you know, two or three tons of, you know, Latin American cocaine in it. Um, and, and the same company is also bribing, you know, French officials um, to try to get them uh, to, to, to allow them to open up a branch in France. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all kind of connected. It, everything is used in the same way. Uh, that's an actual example of, of uh, one of the companies that, that, that we've dealt with. You know, so um, it's, it's an increasingly complex system where, you know, the, the line between law and, and, and uh, disorder are, are, is fast um, uh, disappearing. And many of these uh, cases are, are very complex and increasingly we're seeing the use of, of companies set up by um, especially the organized crime gangs um, to use trade-based money laundering systems. And they use the typical and trade-based, they're, the, they're either under or over invoicing goods and services, they're, they're doing multiple, you know, invoicing for the same products, um, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, uh, not describing stuff, you know, properly. Um, and so a drug shipment that goes across the ocean might also be used for, you know, um, money laundering and the same thing. 
And so um, it, it's, it's really quite breathtaking when you start to peel back the layers on any one of these groups. And, and most of the time when we'll look at a case, we might get five or 10 percent of what's actually going on. Um, but it's, it's increasingly difficult every time we figure something out and publish it, they kind of counter it with another technique. And so for a long time, we were able to find the owners of these companies because they would go set up in Cyprus and they would do it. Uh, do their, their, their illegal action and then we would come to Cyprus and we'd get the records and then Panama records became more available and we outed them there. Um, but now they're using, you know, Vanuatu and they're using the Seychelles um, and even then the, the only names that will show up is, you know, some Burger King employee somewhere, you know, who's got nothing to do with the deal. Um, and it's becoming increasingly more difficult. Uh, everything we do, they counter with, with a new way of operating. And, you know, this of course is partially coming from the wonderful criminal services industry um, that serve them around the world. Um, uh, you know, the, the lawyers, the registration agents, the auditors, uh, you, know, um, you know, thank God for Pakistani auditors in, in London. They've, they've done so many interesting audits that, that you know, um, they get, get approved and uh, allow stuff to continue to go on. So it, there's a whole criminal services industry that essentially supports um, uh, these, these people and how they're doing things. And you know, this is a huge industry. This is somewhere around two to three trillion dollars a year, you know, of the legal activity that, that's going around in the world. And the problem is really, you know, you saw the IRS people up here and, and you know, they seem pretty stern people and, and uh, it, you know, looks, they describe a wonderful system, but, you know, that's America. You know, it's pretty much the Wild West in the rest of the world. Um, there is not nearly the same amount of regulation and, and enforcement that, that goes on. And when you look at the, the kind of the global um, trade business, um, there really is no world policeman. Um, there's a couple weak protocols, some agreements, some OECD signings that always get ignored by, you know, the British government and other actors when they decide that it's not in their interest to enforce it. Um, and, and those are pretty weak. And um, the, the world of organized crime and, and state corruption resides on that area and they move around very effectively. There's no natural enemy really for them in that environment. And, you know, people talk about MLATs here all the time, but, you know, these groups are, these, these various crime things are set up to last six or seven months and then they're gone. They disappear and all the people disappear and new sets of companies are registered and the whole process goes on over and over. And by the time you get an MLAT and you get the information, you know, the pe people are long gone. In fact, you know, we've been, you know, the, uh, the Latvian uh, um, uh, organized crime police um, are now using our databases to get access and look up the record so they can get the answer before they have to file the MLAT. Um, you know, they're, they're using journalistic techniques now to find the information that they need um, because the, the MLATs are just kind of the stamp on the, in the end, but usually that's, that's well after the money has disappeared in the system. Um, and groups know this, and so they, they, they plan in this half-life, and it works very effectively. And until new systems are in place that, that, that will some way stop some of this money from getting around, then it's going to be very difficult. Now that said, you know, based on the stories that we've written, we've had about $1.3 billion uh, seized by governments, um, property, and other assets around the world um, uh, due to our stories. So, I mean, you can, if you can connect it to the end product, which is that nice house in Belgravia and London, you know, or the Wall Street apartment, then you can, can go ahead and, uh, and track these down. The wonderful thing about it is if you look at the real estate industry, um, it's gotten almost ridiculous. There are so many buildings in downtown Manhattan that are empty. And there's whole buildings that are, that are empty in, in some cities um, because they have to you know, pump all this, this, this uh, you know, laundered money into assets. And that's the only advantage tr you truly have. If you can figure out the, you know, where they eventually end, then, then you've got, you know, the properties are often in other parts, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I just want to add that, you know, uh, um, journalism is, is sometimes quite efficient when you deal with such uh, issues as money laundering and organized crime. Um, and that is because journalists can be pre-crime. You can actually prevent crime or better said, you know, um, st stop criminals from doing business as usual. Um, I, I can give you 
numerous example, uh, examples from our work. But what we do is we follow organized crime groups, you know, in a country. We expose them. And what usually happens is the organized crime group just moves elsewhere, uh, you know, somewhere in in Africa, somewhere in Asia, you know. But then, because we are part of this global network, we're able to, um, to actually follow their steps there. So the moment they, they set up new structures, new companies, new, we expose them locally before being able to act. So this is, uh, this is quite efficient because, and affects them uh, on the level of, uh, you know, Google, <laughs> you know, because they need to get partners. And lots of those partners are not dishonest people, you know, they're honest people. And the first thing you do when you, when you have uh, someone, you know, like a potential business partner, you, you, you Google the name probably. And, and of course you can hire a due diligence company and all that, but Googling is, is the easiest, you know. Uh, so what we do is we present the information in databases with the documents attached from various uh, official databases. So whoever conducts that Google search can recreate our searches to see that what we're saying there is true. Uh, so then people have a choice. You know, at some point we identified, you know, these Romanian criminals that uh, were involved in high-level financial fraud in Romania, and uh, they moved to Moldova, to Chisinau, and were about to start this new business um, together with the wife of the head of one of the main secret services in the country. You know, these Eastern European countries, they have lots of secret services, which is the case here in the U.S. as well, I think. Um, but he, uh, what, what they did was they set up these uh, this commercial companies. The next day we found out about those because, uh, you know, we mine databases quite quite a lot, we expose these, and then their partners, their local partners backed of the deal, you know, so that affected them. And of course they called them and they said, you're worse than the police, you're worse than whatever because, you know, you know and, and they called us name, names and all that, and we're happy to hear those, you know. Yeah, actually, Paul got that tip when, when he saw three guys get off an airplane that should not get off an airplane together. And, and that, that kind of made him interested, and so we were able to find that. But we, we are trying to systemize it, as Paul said, and, and um, one of the things we're doing is we're building kind of a master database of organized crime people around the world. One thing about you know organized crime, it's still a business structure. It's still ownership of companies. It's still human beings that are involved in it. Um, and we know the criminal services companies that they're using to, to register um, you know, companies. Sometimes I just go and, and pull up the, you know, what, what the, you know, Taylor Group has registered recently, and it's almost like a master list of, you know, uh, the criminal, uh, you know, activities that are going on. You know, so, so if you know who the people who are doing work for them, then you can you can use that too. Um, and what what we hope to do is we're adding terabytes of data that we've been getting from all over the world, and we want to set up a system where we can basically have have alerts so that any time there's a registration or there's something that's interesting, or even what we're also trying to do is use graph databases and other things to give it a structure that we're interested in. And whenever that structure is registered and shows up in the data, that it sends us an alert and says, hey, this looks like a money laundering structure that you're looking for. And then we can look at it a little bit closely. You know, that's ultimately what we're trying to do is, is to, you know, you, the old days, you know, journalists did name and shame, you know, where you, you mention these people and what they did. But now we're doing what I call hack and track. You know, where we hack up databases and other things, collect all the data, and then when these people show up, we track them as effectively as possible. Um, so uh, I think it's really important to also talk about the Russian context, because a lot of these things, especially the money laundering, has been taking place in Russia. Russia is kind of behind a lot of the criminal activities around the world. And, you know, one of the problems is I think really people don't understand Russia and they don't understand what's going and what the master plan is. And, you know, part of that takes understanding the Russian economy. And so I'll give a quick little thought on, on, on what's happening in Russia. You know, first of all, you know, Putin um, uh, is, is not the ruler of Russia. I mean, he is the ruler of Russia, but he's not the only ruler of Russia. It's a very complex system with a, it's not homogenous. There's a lot of different interest groups that are out there that are all vying for control and power and interest. And a lot of the criminal activity is sanctioned criminal activity. You know, there's no question Russia is a criminal state in that it acts as a, um, it acts on, uh, under international law as a criminal in doing some of these things. But from a Russian perspective, it's really not criminality, it's, it's social and political organization. Um, you know, they would argue rightfully that, you know, in the West you have corruption too, you just legalize it, you know, most of the time, which is true. I mean, if you look at a, you know, one of these super PACs, I mean, that would be bribery in any place on earth. In the United States, it's, 
you know, freedom of speech. Um, you know, so we have, an, and there's tax mitigation, you know, which is okay, whereas in other countries it would be tax evasion. So, you know, we've, we've legalized a lot of corruption that other people um, would, would make illegal. So, so they really see this as kind of a way that a, a, a country can act. It's, it's the controller of its laws. It, it can act any way that it wants. And if it's in the best interest of Russia, um, that's fine. And, and Putin's mindset is very much, I mean, in Russia, the journalists call it, you know, um, you know, uh, the, you know the Soviet Union 2.0. Um, you know, what, what's really happened there is, is they've moved back because of Putin's very conservative mindset back to very traditional ways of operating. Um, but you still have groups within there that are, that are vying and you have really this massive fight that's going on in Russia between, you know, the people who started businesses and really see Russia as, as having great possibility as, a, as an international partner for business and, and investment and everything, um, who've set up a lot of good companies and there's a lot of very good people and they're educated and tend, tend to be young and, um, uh, and then the old line conservative um, uh, groups which probably control about or about 70% of the country would be probably termed a little bit kind of conservative and old line. And so, um, the, 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 and it's also kind of a young, old uh, gender split. It's also an urban rural split. Um, and so consequently, um, you have this fight that's going on in Russia right now. And it can sometimes turn violent, as you can see, as a lot of fights in Russia uh, do. Um, the other thing is that the country has increasingly become more centralized. That's been going on for a number of years. And it's increasingly, as we all know, dependent on oil, natural resources. The whole middle section, the whole, uh, you know, um, uh, manufacturing part of Russia has been hollowed out. Um, because Putin has really not been very interested. He's got very old style views of the world. And so he hasn't, you know, he's, he's comfortable with the centralized economy. And so you're fine to do business. You don't have any problems in most of the parts of the Russia and, until you reach a certain level or size, you know, or you piss off the wrong person. Um, and then you, you have problems. Um, so it's not, it's not as bad as people make it out in the West. The West is, you know, view it as kind of um, a, uh, a really awful, ugly place, and it's got a lot of problems, but it's also not quite as bad. Um, you know, Putin's vision has been, uh, you know, to blame for a lot of this. He's got kind of this industrial, political, criminal philosophy, and he's consciously went out and arrested most of the, the major organized crime figures, put them in prison for a period of time, and then they were all quietly released. Um, and in that time, they all agreed to work with him on certain things. So you'll see a lot of these organized crime structures go on. When, when the Magnitsky case uh, was, was in full bl uh, bloom, you could see where organized crime guys would come in and own businesses, and then they would get murdered off, and then other organized crime guys would come in, and they would get murdered off. And these were people who were called in to play roles in it from the, the criminal world, um, and they were expendable. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and you'll see that in a lot of cases where there are crime figures and state actors acting side by side, and often that's been orchestrated by the government. Um, and then you see his his control of the the region in places like Moldova and Ukraine, where where he goes and grabs certain parts of it, and if he can't grab it, then he sets up little buffer states, which are all run by organized crime figures. If you look at Transnistria and Abkhazia and Ossetia and those places, there's a crime figure in each one of those places that run those country because they're they're more responsive and they're more efficient, you know, compared to other forms of government. Um, and then in other countries, he's trying to undermine them by, by funding, you know, nationalist political groups, um, you know, like Patria in Moldova and, and uh, Marine Le Pen and uh, Viktor Orban uh, takes a lot of money. And that's what a lot of reporters are working on is understanding the flows of money that he's using um, all over the world. But he's in deep trouble. Um, because, you know, he's not particularly overly planned and um, he, he doesn't understand, I think, the modern uh, world and he's very reactive to things. And so what it creates is a very unstable situation where you have a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, dissent has been, you know, forced down and it, it, it could end up blowing up at some times and all the states in that region are, are similar. So, and then of course, um, you know, we as journalists, we get, you know, the troll army comes after us all the time. We've had a lot of bad things written about us and every time we publish a story, we get 
dozens and sometimes hundreds of people, you know, and that's that's orchestrated in a factory in in um, St. Petersburg where people are paid a thousand dollars a month um, to go out and every time somebody says something bad about Russia or Putin uh, or any of these people, um, now now Putin would argue, well, you you know that's USAID, you know you you know that's the same thing, you know you're giving money to those types of people who say bad things about corrupt people, um, so you know and, and and part of that is is somewhat true, but you know. Um, uh, the other thing that's really interesting is there there has been, and this is affecting the underlying relationship, is for the last five or ten years even, there's been a hot war going on between Russia and China and the United States. Um, and most of this is involved in, in you know, um, information theft and, and um, hacking that's going on. And I, I talked with an American hacker who was hired by the U.S. government to steal six billion dollars from a Ukrainian bank account of Vladimir Putin. Um, and this happens all the time to the United States. I mean, there are, there are China and Russia and are, are doing it, and even smaller countries. And the idea behind this is, you know, if you can steal the sovereign wealth of a country, you basically seriously affect its long-term, you know, ability to pay its debts and to be a, an active member of the international community. Um, and that's going on. It's not being written about very much, but we see the fingerprints of that uh, all over the place. So um, um, the other thing is that um, you know there's a lot of uh, you know uh, manipulation that's going on in the oil um, business and in in um, in uh, you know financial markets to keep the ruble up and do other things. But it's causing a lot of instability, and that's that's the real problem. So. Um, we wanted to make this short, and uh, we I, somewhat succeeded. You want to say something? Here? Yeah. Um, just, uh, I mean, all this, you know, affects uh, media uh, all over our region as well, you know. Uh, so it, it, it um, affects us, you know, too. Um, uh, but, but I'll just give you, uh, give you an example. So we published this uh, laundromat investigation on our website, and then a part uh, of it, you know, the UK angle to it was also published in, in London with the uh, Independent. And uh, Russia Today, uh, RT, you know, which is the main kind of um, foreign <laughs> Russian TV station, um, called us up, you know, called me up and said, hey, we're really interested in this story, you know, we just read it, so this is money, you know, that is laundered in the UK, and, you know. Um, and I said, sure. Uh, and so they, they invited us to speak in the main show that they have in the evening, you know. Um, and I said, sure, but, you know, I'm away, I was somewhere else, you know, so I uh, referred them to Drew. And Drew talked to them, and, uh, but what happened was, in the meantime, they realized that what was published in the UK was not the whole story. You know, they only published the UK angle. So when they saw the, when they saw the name of Igor Putin, they just canceled the interview, you know. And saying, actually, the reporter was fired. Who yeah, and the reporter me, was so. fired. Poor, poor lady. Yeah. Uh, we're actually sorry. So, so the media has, has, has to suffer be, because of this. You know, I mean, there's, um, there are lots, lots of problems that are ignited by, by such uh, you know, money laundering operations. Um, but I just want to, to provoke you a little bit, because I know that here in the room we have uh, quite a few uh, people that uh, establish companies, you know, offshore type of companies or other type of companies, so I'm talking about formation agents. So I'm, I'll just go back to this, uh, these promissory notes, you know, that were used in order to wire the money from Russia to uh, Moldova and then to, to the UK, to, uh, to Latvia, sorry. So not sure if you see it. So if, if we could see it on the bigger screen screens as well, maybe. Uh, that would make more sense. Can we have this same image, this promissory note on those? If not, you, you can probably see it here. Um, you see, there's, there's, always, there's um, uh, always a name, I mean, uh, of, of, a, of a person on these uh, promissory notes. And if you check here, there's, uh, there's a, a guy called Arthur Keith Barber. Um, if you check a little bit further in the document, you'll see that this is between a, a company called Goldbridge Trading Limited and another company that is based in Delaware. But the truth is, there is no Goldbridge, G-O-L, Bridge Trading Limited, anywhere in the world. So there is no such company. There is a company in London called Goldbridge, G-O-L-D, you know. And there's nowhere in the world a guy called Arthur with A-R-T-U-R, -R, Kit Barber. There is a guy called Arthur with a T-H. If we look 
uh, the, this other promissory note, uh, it's, it's kind of washed up. But the, the signator of this is a guy called Jesse Grant Hester, spelled J-A-S-S-E. There is no such guy in the world, you know. There is a Jesse, spelled in the normal way, J-E-S-S-E, -S -S you know. And if you look again at the companies involved, you'll, you'll again find the same gold bridge, which there, there is no such company anywhere in the world. And this goes on and on. So this is on all promissory notes, you know, you have some misspellings, which I would say, you know, I mean, if this is a promissory note wor worth uh, 580 million US dollars, you know, it's a 580 million US dollars bill, how can you have these spelling mistakes? What do you think? <laughs> So I guess with this we'll uh, open up for, for questions or for comments or for any other form of... <laughs> yeah. Do we have questions? Again, we can't see anybody. So um, if, uh, is there anybody with the microphone um, handy that um, has David disappeared? Well, then let's do the shout it out and then um, I'll repeat it um, so that everybody can hear it. Is there anybody with a question? Down here, yes. You, you have a, a large, increasingly large database of information. Uh, is is that if is that information uh, searchable by any of us here? Um, some of it will be searchable in the near future. Yeah, I mean, it is on that. We have a website called Investigative Dashboard, um, and Investigative Dashboard is kind of a research desk around the world uh, for, um, uh, for, for journalists and, and um, uh, we, a lot of the information that we collect is, is added to that particular um, database and a lot of the public records uh, that we have will be made available through that. Um, our list of the organized crime figures, uh, there, there are some of those, uh, we have a thing called the People of Interest Project which you'll find on our main website. It's fairly small on our main website, but we have one in Spanish called uh, Persona de Interes, um, which uh, has about 600 um, uh, Latin American uh, organized crime figures, um, people of interest, um, uh, politicians, and other people that are of interest to um, uh, the, um, the news media. I'm not saying all these people are organized crime figures, um, but I am saying they are interesting in this issue. Um, and so consequently, um, that has a lot of the records uh, that we have available. Um, and eventually all of those will be available through the uh, investigative dashboard and many of the databases. We, we've got, you know, we've got about 10 terabytes um, and we're, we're in the process of, we, we've never had the, the help that we've needed from the technology side, but now we do. Um, and, and we've got a, a data scientist and, and some programmers who are, who are setting it up and, you know, I mean, we've got, you know, in, in, the, in the developing world, data is something that um, there's, a, there's a brisk market um, of selling data out the backside of, of government agencies, unfortunately. So if you were to go on the street in Moscow, you can get a copy of a database of everybody who's been on a domestic flight um, and their seat number, you know, for the last 10 years. Um, and so anybody who's worked in Moscow know all about these, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and there's, there's some actual legitimate databases that you can get in legitimate ways. Um, Whatever is legitimate uh, public records, we will be making available uh, to the public through those databases um, and through those things. Uh, there's, there's some records now, I think Luxembourg records and, and some Swiss records and some other ones, um, but we have a lot more that we uh, need to put up, so. Um, so just to uh, go a bit further with this, uh, so what we what we do with the with the ID with the investigative dashboard is we have uh, three parts to it. Uh, one is where we index uh, information that we scrape from websites, from many registries of companies and, and such. Um, then we have uh, an index itself of uh, databases around the world where you can uh, access company data and sometimes court records and other types of records. And third, the third part, uh, it's, it's used uh, by journalists and activists from all over the world, is a research desk, uh, which is, is basically a pro bono due diligence service for journalists and activists. Um, and there we have, uh, you know, these researchers based uh, in Eastern Europe, in uh, 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 Arab countries, in Africa, uh, here in the region, 
um, and these guys will uh, will answer requests like company ownership requests and of course they go uh, they, they go very deep with their research so for instance if someone asks for a Cyprus based company and the Cyprus based company is owned by a company based in the Seychelles we'll do our best to, uh, to get some data from the Seychelles and if and and, and so on and so on um, but what we're trying to do with this is um, also to, to co-opt as many research librarians in these efforts as possible. You know, the research librarians that work for business schools all over the U.S. and other countries, um, those, those guys, they have amazing uh, skills. They have access to otherwise, you know, really costly databases because they are attached to universities, you know, and business schools like the Stanford Graduate School of Business and, and such. Uh, so uh, what we're doing is we're trying to work with them, a system where, you know, activists and journalists, you know, investigative reporters uh, have access to this data so that these people, you know, donate a little bit of their time to do uh, meaningful research for, this, for these guys, you know. So there are, there are lots of um, efforts that we're, we're doing on our side. Uh, we're actually suing uh, uh, governments in the EU, you know, to uh, free data, you know, and I'm talking about the registries of companies uh, all over the place. We believe that that data should be public data, as it is in many countries, actually. Um, of course, there are quite a few efforts towards beneficial ownership and, you know, and others. So we work with uh, organizations like Transparency International sometimes and Open Society and, and other type of organizations. Um, we also train um, law enforcement. Um, we had like a couple of weeks ago, you know, um, at this uh, training for prosecutors and uh, uh, banking, uh, banking people, you know, from compliance departments in banks where uh, what, w what we're doing is we're showing them our methods, you know, and how do we, how do we track down the money so that when you file the, the MLAT, you, you don't, don't just wait for Cyprus to give you some data when you can see firsthand, you know, that the company in Cyprus is owned by the company in, in elsewhere, you know, uh, in Delaware, you know, so that you can actually file all the requests at once to speed up the process to be able to match a little bit, you know, the, the criminals. The criminals are much, much faster than, uh, than journalists are and then, uh, you know, law enforcement are so yeah the one, I mean, one of the things you know I, I love police but you know the cops the, the cops will subpoena to find out how many inches in a foot you know I mean they subpoena everything and they never use kind of public record sources and journalists all we have is public record sources so we've kind of developed you know for, for, with very little information how, how are we going to find out what's really going on so, so we, we have some fairly developed ways to do that and to you know we can pierce you know even in British Virgin Islands and places like that we can usually find find out the beneficial owner in 30 to 40 percent, no, 30 percent of the cases, you know, um, you know, because there's always techniques and there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, banking information, there's, there's loan information where you can often find out related parties. And if you get every single public record that's available, you know, you can often make some connections and figure out who's behind it. Um, so, so, I mean, you know, but, but, you know, don't come to us after the thing and say, hey, I've got some due diligence work I need in Moldova, because unfortunately we can't do that. Um, you know, we're a journalism organization. Um, but, but someday we, um, you know, ID might be, our, our board of directors is considering spinning it off as a commercial organization that can do that kind of research. And, you know, the problem is in all these places, many of you know, I mean, you need local knowledge. In Bosnia, to get the ownership of a company, you need to, um, there are 17 different jurisdictions that you need to fax. You can't do it any other way. You have to fax them a request that has to be in a certain way and then you get the results over about a two month period, you know, from right away to two months later. Um, and even then you have to go and follow up on stuff and, you know, most of our great records don't come from the, the, uh, the, the, the court system, which is where it keeps the ownership information. You know, these, these Eastern European countries are very bureaucratic from, from the old days of socialism and communism. And so consequently, if you need to do anything, you need 100 stamps from some different offices and you have to go and if you want to get your electricity hooked up, you need to prove that you own the, the building and so you have to have file all your paperwork at the electricity department, which is where we get a lot of our records. Um, so it's kind of these uh, alternative uh, places to um, to find information in these countries that our reporters have been doing for many years, and also when we go for these cross-border uh, investigations, um, we're playing a lot with geographies because you know let's say you're following this BVI company 
And of course, I mean, you file a request with the BVI, you know, registry of companies, and you pay 50, 50 US dollars, you know, and you get, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, a, sort of a good standing paper or, or something with no uh, owners on it, with, with no, you know, and uh, but then. Uh, what we do in, in such cases is we look at all the countries where that company might be, uh, you know, active. And you'd be amazed how much you can get from the Serbian registry of companies or the Romanian registry of companies where you find out there's a shopping mall, you know, that was just built in the outskirts of Bucharest and this company shows up in the company records. But when you get the, the file, the complete file from the, from the court in Romania, you actually find documents saying the beneficial owner of, of the, this BVI company is this guy. I mean, with the name, surname, you know, with uh, with everything. So it's it's quite important to go go around as as much as possible because people at some point, you know, need to have contact with with their money, you know. And we're using lots of banking records without uh, even leaks uh, or stuff, you know. So Drew was mentioning this case where you know one uh, Mexican drug cartel. Uh, he was talking about the Sinaloas, you know, they were laundering money uh, via uh, via Latvia. Um, now, what happened in that case was. Uh, very, very, uh, I mean, small court case, some Romanian businessman who was uh, stolen of like uh, half a million US dollars, and he sued these guys in a court again in Moldova. In Chisinau, the police in Moldova subpoenaed these records from the, from the bank in Latvia, but they, they subpoenaed two years worth of uh, banking records, you know, where they were only interested in that half a million transaction. Now, for journalists, once, uh, once these were uh, in court, these became public records, and two years of, uh, you know, transactions on this, uh, New Zealand based company with a bank account uh, in Latvia, um, uh, we actually knew that the company was dealing with the Sinaloas, was golden. You know, I mean, we got all those records and it was, you know, while again, the police was just focused on that particular case. And to us, you know, it opened a new world. So, uh, yeah, so these this insta instances uh, allow us to kind of, what Drew was saying, to pierce the veil. And once you're in, you know, information starts pouring and pouring and pouring. And then the Moldovan police, police say things like, well, what else would you, uh, if you had the power, uh, what else would you uh, go ahead and get? And, you know, that's when you have really good relationships and you can get all sorts of, you can track people down in many different places. So another question, we'll try to be less uh, long-winded. You identified two countries as being huge problems, Latvia and you mentioned uh, Montenegro. Uh, there is a European Union anti-money laundering directive and Latvia should be subject to it. What has happened there and why hasn't there been follow-up? And then in the case of Montenegro, they're using the euro but they're not part of the Eurozone, and it should be obvious that this place is a huge money laundering center. Uh, why hasn't anything happened? It just doesn't even get talked about much in the West. Why don't you take Latvia? I'll take Montenegro. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so Latvia. Uh, yeah, is indeed a EU country. There's an anti-money money laundering directive there. But unfortunately, it's not applied at the level that it should be applied. You know, uh, the EU talks right now about establishing this uh, joint uh, prosecution office. There's no, you know, uh, um, law enforcement that goes all the way from, from Latvia to the UK to Germany to all that. There's no much cooperation inside the EU. And of course, you could argue there's Europol, you know, and there are other structures. They don't function, actually, you know. They don't function. I mean, if you look at the US, and the cooperation between states and the FBI and all this, you know, it's, it's really, I mean, years, years ahead of what's going on in Europe. Um, and that's because, you know, in Europe you still have that paradigm of the nation state and uh, sovereignty and, uh, you know, all, all those uh, <laughs> nice things in, uh, in Europe in, in some, some instances. But this, you know, from the point of view of enforcing the law, this doesn't allow for the enforcing of, of the law. So this is why, um, you know, we were wondering ourselves, so what's going on? Any country in the EU could subpoena those records, you know, of the Latvian bank. Uh, the only country that did was the UK because some of the money went there, you know. But we pointed out to other countries uh, being involved and nobody reacted. Yeah, I think, I think there are people in Latvia that are trying, there's some good law enforcement agencies there and, and there is a desire to do it, but you know, and, and a lot of these countries, you know, a lot of the banks that, that, that were being used are very, 
you know, connected to, you know, um, strong political parties there still. Now these are these little um, kind of boutique banks that the front door is locked all the time, and and you got to kind of get an appointment to come in to see them. You know, who are who are doing not trusted you know, though. Well, not, not trusted, but but some some of the banks that have been involved in other money laundering things. So and and they're often owned by um, you know uh, pe people who have strong uh, political connections and make you know, fun political parties. And that's been the problem there is, is you know, it's easier to stop something um, than it is to, uh, to to get something to go all the way through to the end. And I think Latvia is making a lot of progress. I, I think, you know, they're, they're, they don't like this reputation and they're trying hard to change it. And there is progress. Montenegro, on the other hand, you know, um, I mean, you know, m the only thing I can say about Montenegro is, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister of Montenegro, his first job in his life was as Prime Minister of Montenegro. You know, that, that tells you something <laughs> right there. And uh, it, uh, you know, he's a, he's a very problematic person who's openly admitted to smuggling cigarettes with the Camorra and the Sacra Corona Unita crime families. Um, and, you know, he's very good and very persuasive with European regulators. Um, but, you know, they know the Europeans don't really, they, they can't, they, they're easily divided. Um, a, a number of these organizations, you know, the, the Americans are easily manipulated on the issue of Kosovo and other, other things that are really important. You know, the Americans get all hot and bothered about one topic and they're willing to make all sorts of deals, um, you know, in, in, and um, that, that can mean that, you know, the compromising goes on. And, uh, you know, I think that they're just very clever. I think that their, their long-term hope is to actually join the EU and clean up the system, um, but they're just going to hold out as long as possible. And a number of these states are using, you know, they're, they're playing the Russian angle, you know, uh, versus Europe um, on some of these issues now. That's back in vogue. It works again. And so people are using that to a certain extent, you know. And there's a fear in Europe that some of these states will become these little black holes of criminality um, on the edge edge of Europe, um, which are very unstable and potential to cause another, another land war, and that worries the Europeans a lot. But I mean, I think, you know, um, the, the process of European extension is, is very important, um, and I think, uh, you know, if they don't do what they did with Bulgaria and Romania, which is essentially just let them in and then try to fix them afterwards, we've seen how, how that works. Romania is only now starting to really make progress, but Bulgaria is still um, very, very far behind. Um, you know, I think it's going to end up being about a 20-year dance um, with, with a country like Montenegro, a 20 to 30 year dance to try to get them into the EU and to clean up their system. And, you know, the Djukanovic and his, his, his group of, you know, I mean, it, every big name in organized crime has property there and has, it's kind of home base. You go there and you're protected, you know. And uh, I think he's just going to play it out for 30 years and in the meantime, uh, you know, create a, a very lucrative, uh, you know, criminal Monte Carlo-like state where uh, he can have fun and deal drugs and do all the other sorts of things. Montenegro is now one of the largest importer of drugs in Europe. Um, uh, there's a huge, you know, South American connection that's going on. And if you look at the United States, the amount of um, criminal money to government money is about uh, a 1 to 40. And government is about 40 p parts and crime has, has won. Mexico, which has a ratio of about 10 to 1, which has almost made it ungovernable. Montenegro, the ratio is 1 to 1. So it's ungovernable, and that's, that's true in a lot of these countries, in African countries. When the drug-to-government drug ratio gets so high, it's impossible to really enforce anything, and you have to negotiate then with the drug dealers um, and the criminals rather than with the state. Um, and that sometimes happens. And I think that's the case in Moldova, too. Uh, I mean, Moldova also has these ambitions, you know, to join the EU. But if you talk there with the pro-Russian uh, politicians and the pro-European politician, politicians, you'll see that they have a common interest you know, in actually keeping uh, Moldova uh, outside of the EU. The pro-European ones, you know, they just don't want to get to jail. 
they are afraid because they know what they've done that far in terms of business because most of these guys are businessmen, you know, big time businessmen in the, in, in, in the tiny country. They know it's criminal, it's outright criminal, you know. So then you, you have all these games and then you have international donors that ca come into the country and, you know, US and EU donors and of course they back these um, uh, pro-European parties, but they don't realize, you know, that the people that they're backing, they have no interest in joining at this point in time unless they devise some really clever plan with, you know, like a full amnesty of, uh, I mean, you erase all the past, you erase how the, how the money was made and then maybe, you know, allow everybody to, to start fresh, you know. But otherwise this is, uh, as, as Drew said, it's, 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 it's just a game, you know. It's a game and, uh, you know, in the case of Romania, yeah, Romania entered the EU or Bulgaria and then it started cleaning up the, the act, you know, former prime minister in jail. Uh, it's actually one, one and a half governments in Romania are in jail right now, you know plus uh, about 30, 40 members of the parliament. So, and that also takes a toll because now there's a huge, um, uh, you know, I mean, fight against the prosecution in Bucharest and against, you know, and uh, these people are using the media very cleverly and that leads again to corruption in the media, corruption in other parts of the society. Yeah, it doesn't help that about, um, probably about uh, 15 to 20 percent of the media is owned by organized crime, you know, another 30 percent to 40 percent is owned by political interests and parties, and then the rest is um, either marginally independent or non-transparent. Um, so it, it's a, the, the media in, in that part of the world is, is very problematic, and that's where you get a lot of the information, and unfortunately um, that's something we're, we're working on. Other questions? Right. Okay. Bill and I were just saying one allegation that, that you hear quite a lot, and John Le Carre wrote a whole book about it, is a part of oh, I'll just use my one, one allegation that you hear about quite a lot, John Le Carre wrote a whole book about it, uh, Our Kind of Traitor, is that the dirty Russian money that is sent into the Western world is not just going there for money laundering purposes, but it was a actually a specific tactic to stop uh, the West from going after Russia if uh, some sort of point of conflict should, should arise. And, um, so I know you talked a lot about the difficulties that people have in the countries where you work going after the money, but how successful do you think that Russian strategy has been in stopping authorities in Western countries who have jurisdiction in these, in these laundering cases from going after the Russian money? I think speaking to the UK, I mean, it's been very successful. I mean, if you look at the UK, you know, the UK knows that it takes a tremendous amount of, um, uh, you know, stolen money. Um, and that's known by the highest levels. And, but the problem is, it, it will, if you try to remove that money from the system, you will see a demonstrative effect on the standard of living of the British people. Because what that money is leading to is very low cost, uh, low interest rates, um, you know, a, a lot of access to money, and a lot of, um, you know, asset um, uh, growth in, in terms of, um, in terms of va values of assets. So, you know, if, if the UK were to quit their, you know, their equivalent of their heroin addict, you know, uh, addiction, um, they would be in deep trouble. And so, you know, you'll notice, we, we notice the UK is one of the worst um, countries when it, when it comes to, you know, criticizing people, you know, on these, on these issues. They shut up really quickly. Um, and so, especially some of the smaller states like Azerbaijan and, and Central Asia and things like that. And you see Tony Blair running out and Prince, uh, what is it, Prince... Uh, Andrew going out to, to Azerbaijan all the time where he gets his little gold encrusted watch every time he visits that's worth about $250,000, you know. And so, so, you know, a lot of people won't, um, won't do it because they know that it's, it's going to be a problem and, um, you know. And uh, I just think, I mean, a, a lot of this goes back to the 70s and the 80s, you know. Um, and I'll refer again to a country like Romania. Romania was a communist country till 89. Uh, but not many people know that in 89, Romania was the only country in the world with 0-4 in debt. So in December 89, when Ceausescu fell, 0-4 in debt. Now, a lot of debt, uh, foreign debt was paid, you know, from drug money. There were 
huge drug trafficking operations, you know, ran by the secret services in Romania, by the um, DIE, on, with the external, the foreign secret service, the equivalent of the Russian uh, SVR right now. Um, and, you know, these guys were, you know, operating all over the world. And a lot of that money, you know, uh, had this double purpose. So these uh, operations had, had this double purpose, you know, to sell the drugs in the West, you know, and to somehow weaken the Western societies, you know, that was the, the, the idea. And then to also make money that would pay the, the foreign debt so that would make, you know, communist countries independent from the banksters, you know. So that's, uh, it's this dual game, you know, that, uh, that was played all along. And I mean, a country in crisis, you know, uh, at least a, uh, an Eastern European country in crisis, would do, would do lots of things, you know, uh, in the world, you know, would just use the, 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 the cross-border financial systems, you know, in order to, you know, to make up for the, for the loss and to, to just uh, try to, to, to keep power, you know, and, and things like this. I think one, one thing you are seeing, though, is that there's a lot more competition for those dirty monies. I mean, uh, Dubai has done a very good job of attracting a lot of Russian money. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing uh, Azerbaijan now has, has visions of becoming with their white city that they're building, the next great, you know, Dubai, you know, of money laundering where everything's built by the president's family. So he can not only launder the money for you, but he can give you your house and everything else um, and then sell you your oil. Um, and, and I think that there are other countries that, that have that kind of vision. Montenegro would like to do that. Um, and so, so, you know, there's going to be more pressure on, on places like the UK um, to keep that, that, that flow of money coming in. So, you know, when you've got to launder $20 million, you know, that's kind of difficult, you know, but when you have to launder $20 billion, you know, that's a whole other level. And, and, you know, that's why you'll see, you know, 20, you know, floors of a, of a building in Dubai get bought, you know. Um, you know, you, you, it, it's much, much harder to, to launder those kind of monies and, um, you know, um, but it's very lucrative to, to many of the criminal services industries folks. So let's go over there and then here. Yeah, I was curious to know what, I mean, your information or your experience with, and there's a lot of people from the Caribbean here, of Russian and Eastern European investment in the Caribbean. It looks like it's something that happened only in the 90s, stopped for a while, and it looks like it's coming back, and you have private businesses and even organized crime making investments in some of the islands. And when I say the Caribbean, it's not only the islands, talking Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, so. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think um, it, it is coming back to a certain extent. I think the Caribbean has cleaned up its act, you know, which, which has kind of hurt it in attracting some of this money. But you start to get more money that's been already laundered. It starts to get invest there. So it, it's the cleaner end of the thing once it gets out, you know. Um, then it goes into, um, into hedge funds and other things that can then be moved around into some of these places and invested, you know more. Um, but, you know, I mean, in terms of company registration, there's, you know, BVI is a standby, you know, you can always go to BVI when you're a criminal. And, and we always get, you know, there's, there's dozens of, you know, we, we deal with probably two to three hundred criminal companies based in, in, in that open offices in BVI. Um, and that, that's, not, you know, that's just us. And, and that's, that's not unusual. Um, and I, yeah, I think, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the greater the transparency, the less you get um, these, these kind of people. I mean, they're not, and the criminals aren't choosing BVI or any of these countries. It's the criminal services industry, which is kind of helping them, you know, set this up. Um, so, you know, and it, you know, it goes in, 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 it depends on who, you know, there's relatively few of the, of the, of the business services industry that I would classify as a criminal services. It's probably, you know, somewhere around 5%. Um, but those players, you know, depending on what their trends are and who they're using, you know, will, will greatly affect where some of these illegal things are being registered. But, you know, I mean, uh, Panama now, I, I mean, if you look at the massive growth in Panama City of the tall buildings and the other things, you know, 
um, you, you can't help but think, you know, uh, a lot of that is coming from, from laundered money. And actually, I mean, since you mentioned Panama, you know, to us it's, it's quite uh, interesting to uh, watch and to try to understand the uh, local politics. I mean, you look in Panama, you know, you see the president that has a sort of a conflict with some of the biggest law firms, uh, you know, in, in the country. And those law firms are involved in establishing, you know, lots of companies for, for dictators in Eastern Europe and others, you know. So among the, the honest people that they establish companies for, there are these bad, rotten kind of apples, you know. But you see the president trying to, to push one way. You see those law firms, you know, which have a lot of power in the country, you know, pushing the other way. And that, I think, happens everywhere. I mean, you, you look at in Europe, you look at Gibraltar, it's the same. I mean, Cyprus is the same. These are countries with not much uh, many resources, you know. Uh, you look at Delaware, you know, almost half of the state coffers are, uh, you know, filled with money from uh, company formation. So, I mean, there's got to be, I mean, uh, we, we're aware that things are not uh, as simple as, you know, I mean, uh, you've you got to find the alternatives and, and stuff. But until then, we'll, we'll keep on investigating, you know, and uh, keep on finding these funny things about, I don't know, Panama or, or other Caribbean countries. Could we up front here? Uh, the mic. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> for your explanation. And I have two questions. The first one is that um, if, you, if what you say is true, you should be dead. <laughs> um, I remember, you know, three years ago, I was doing an investigation on the uh, <clears throat> counterfeiting industry of cigarette in Russia. And um, I remember a dinner at the Metropole Hotel where I met uh, an ex-retired general of the FSB and the guy told me that uh, he knew that I loved my family and my grandchildren and that he advised me to stop the investigation and honestly I stopped it. And I subcontracted the investigation to local Russian investigators. So I wonder why you are still alive. Second, uh, I also wonder how you can, how you, where, how are you financed for doing all this? Because it costs a fortune to do the type of investigation you do. So if it's not indiscreet, I just no, would no, like not. to hear about how you get the money for doing all this job and why you do it. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, I, I think on the on the safety issue, um, uh, you know. Um, we're alive because um, we have reporters in each of these countries that have those sources and, and you know, are part of the, the uh, ecosphere of those countries. You know, we work with, in, in Russia, we work with Novaya Gazeta, you know, and um, Novaya Gazeta has been doing courageous work for a long time. They've lost six reporters over the time, but, you know, they, they continue to do courageous work. We, we've never had any of reporters working with us killed or injured in any way. But, you know, yes. Jailed. Um, but, we, yes, one of our reporters is in prison in Azerbaijan, for, but that's the government uh, which did that. Um, uh, you know, but you can do this work uh, safely and professionally um, if you, if you, uh, you know, give people an opportunity to comment on it and if you, 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 you always tell the truth and you have the, the facts and the evidence to back it up. Um, and, and I think that helps. And, and also, I mean, if you work in a network, when you confront uh, the person that you're investigating, the first thing you make clear is that you operate in a network that goes across many countries and everybody in the network has the same piece of information because the enemy is not you, the enemy is the information, you know, so the moment they realize they can't, you know, I mean, of course, lots of these people try to bribe us, try to hire us, you know, we were, you know, offered all sorts of jobs with them, you know, and stuff and, um, you know, so, the moment you, you operate like that, you know, then, then it's safer. It kind of shares the risk across the network. Um, now, coming to your, your second question, the funding has to do with this as well, with, with the security. So, uh, the funding is uh, very transparent on our website. So, you'll see that uh, some of our main donors include the uh, USAID, Open Society, uh, the Swiss government uh, right now, and, and, and other, um, other sources like this. When these guys, check our website and see, okay, so they get a lot of funding from the U.S. government. Oh, they might be, they, they, they should be CIA or FBI or something like that because uh, it's also, these people, you know, um, 
when we uncover, you know, organized crime and corruption, we go through so many countries and we get so many records that uh, lots of these guys, you know, uh, who are on to, to use the media, who own media in their respective countries, they're, they're used to low-level reporters that are handed some file from someone, you know, and they, they don't work hard. So our hard work is sometimes taken as okay, so they're really, in, you know, directly in contact with the DEA or the FBI and they, were, they fed them. So they don't see us as, as the enemy, which is good. You know, um, they, they see us as tools for someone else. So the first question they ask whenever we go to them and say, okay, so you have this company here and this company is involved in this, they say, who's paying you? Are they my opponents? Um, is it some really important, you know, kind of state actor that is behind you? Is it some law enforcement agency? <laughs> is it, you know? I mean, and, and, and engage. We, we engage even some of the most dangerous organized crime figures we talk to and we get them to understand who we're doing and what we're doing. Um, and, you know, you'd be surprised. I mean, you can, you know, if you have a certain amount of credibility with these people, you can talk to them on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, we, we literally have organized crime guy, guys calling us all the time. You know, we're, we're, it's kind of a cool thing now to have OCCRP write a story about you. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, they engage us and, you know, as long as you're dealing with a high enough person in the, in the network and they're smart, um, you can do it fairly safely. There's, there's danger doing our job, there's no question about it. And we take precautions and when, you know, we look for, for being tailed and, and other things, I mean, we've got all sorts of warning signs that we have a problem. But, you know, it's, it's not as dangerous as it sounds. Yeah. It is the truth. And actually, if you, if you check our website, ocrp.org, you'll see that we just released this uh, film, you know, 40, 44 minutes film, you know, about uh, these bankers and these hired killers. And we talked to, to everybody there. And there's a character in the, in the film. Uh, and we exposed his, you know, illegal activities and things like this. And that happened about two years ago, you know, when we uh, uh, wrote an, an article on him. And then, of course, we talked to him about all that, and after the, the, the publishing, he contacted us again, and he said, look, if you're really honest, you know, I will give you right now some documents that prove that, you know, I paid for these trips, you know, for the prime minister of this country to attend this uh, final, uh, this, uh, you know, there's a European football, football championship, a soccer championship, and, you know, I paid like a lounge there and there, and a room in this hotel in Switzerland, and blah, 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 you know, and, he, and, and we took the documents, and we verified everything, and we published because it was in the public interest. So even if the source was, you know, a guy who we presented, you know, before as, you know, involved in uh, dirty dealings. Uh, so that's, that's something I, I think that's, that's quite important. You, be, uh, yeah, you become part of the ecosphere and they accept and, you as what you're doing. And you're very honest with them. That's it, you know. It's it, we, we have honor amongst the thieves. <laughs> Other questions? I'm not seeing very well. We have, we have about five minutes left. No questions? Question there? Okay. You're, you're in the white zone, so I don't see you back there. Yeah, I don't see you. What is your process for verifying documents? Um, you know, often we're getting the documents directly from the various governmental agencies. So, so we, do, we, we don't rely a lot on, on leaked documents. We don't rely on, um, I mean, we, we do rely on leaked documents. You have to, but, uh, you know, a lot of times we're going in and getting the records ourselves. Um, and when we do get a leaked document, we, we, we got an intelligence file from Serbia. Intelligence files are always traditionally very difficult documents to deal with and we generally have the rule of we don't use them because you know a lot of them are fictional or some of them are just crazy um, and so we ignore a lot of these documents but this particular one was very interesting and, and had some credibility so we went in and we independently verified every single bit of information so we never relied on the document at all um, but, but use the information to generate other documents to prove. And, and actually what we do, so for instance, uh, if we have to check a name of a person or a company, you know, we start with the global databases. We go to a Mint Global, to a Dance and Brestry, to whatever, you know, for this kind of meta level. And of course from there you can get some, some records that we'll never be able to use in our investigation. But once we identify that the, the entity, you know, has some other interest in this country and that country, then we go into our network and we go locally to the local database and we retrieve the documents from these databases. But still, this is not enough because uh, although we like, you know, online and databases and stuff, we know that uh, a lot more is offline. So then we have people 
going to courts, going to various offices to get these documents. And if we need to, we get these documents, you know, with, uh, yeah, as Drew mentioned, you know, in Eastern Europe, you need to have lots of stamps, you know. So we, we go to a notary to authenticate them and to do all sorts of other stuff. Sometimes you have to get translations, you know, uh, to these documents and to understand them better. And of course, we always talk to experts, you know, about, about how, to, uh, how to take a document, how to, how to read a document. But the idea is we always go down, you know, like we always do the field work uh, to get these records. So we, we never rely on what we get from a Mint Global or from this kind of databases, you know, that, that we're using. Those are the starting point. But then we go, you know, to the reporter. And of course, uh, in, the, in this process, you know, to verify the documents, we talk to the people involved. Because, you know, you, you see a company somewhere in the world with John Smith in it. How do you know that it's your John Smith? So then we go for the reporter's work, you know, which is the traditional reporter's work, you know. But then, you know, we, we, we don't use a lot of documents, too, that we get, and, you know, that's always unfortunate, but, you know, in, in the end, I mean, you know, um, we, we have to use very conservative, you know, journalism standards in the first place. We don't rely on unnamed sources. Um, we, we have to use the British libel law standard because we're, we're kind of a global organization, which is absolute truth. So unless there's some document that we can refer to saying something, you know, we don't rely on any kind of, you know, um, you know traditional, um, um, you know, undercover sources and things that, that other journalists do. And we don't use documents that are internal documents unless we can prove you know, who got those documents, they were in a position to get them, and then give a, an opportunity of the organization itself to respond to those documents. And these come under the obligation of our libel insurance too. So we have libel insurance, and uh, we're working with law firms that, uh, you know, whenever we have a heavy investigation, this is vetted by lawyers, you know, and we have a back and forth, and, you know, with, with the lawyers. And, of course, because we want everything in, they want everything out, and so on and so on. So. Last question. Any last questions? Okay, well thank you very much for, uh, you. for having us here and uh, we look forward to talking to you all. So.